This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for resolve dash masterclass. All right. And we're live. Happy Friday. Al. Happy, Happy Friday. Friday. Welcome, Michael. Happy, Happy long you. weekend to our Canadian friends out there who are having Victoria Day on Monday. It's a bit of fun. That's right. And before we jump in, Mike, do you want to hit us with that uh, good yeah, old disclaimer? You, sh you shouldn't get advice from four dudes on Friday on our YouTube channel. So otherwise, go get advice from responsible professionals who know your situation. Now we can have a wide ranging conversation on all kinds of fun stuff. That's right. That's right. Michael, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, I guess to kick off, it would be great for you to give us a little bit of your background uh, and how you've arrived where you are today in your career, focusing on uh, all aspects of liquidity. Okay. Well, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here and to discuss uh, what I think is the, uh, the main topic for everybody, which is understanding liquidity and particularly global liquidity. So to start at the beginning, how did I get here? Um, the answer is that uh, I run a company called Cross Border Capital. Uh, Cross Border Capital has been in existence for about 20 odd years. Uh, it's an investment advisor based in London. Uh, my previous uh, background was that uh, uh, I suppose I started in the finance industries uh, back in the late 1980s at Salomon Brothers. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is really a direct uh, add on to those Salomon Brothers days. Uh, Salomon was the, as many people would probably still recall, uh, Salomon was the world's biggest um, fixed income trader, uh, big in Forex markets uh, globally. Uh, it was the bond market in many cases. And in terms of understanding how markets worked, the, uh, the sort of ethos of Salomon was watch the money. Uh, money flows are all important. And uh, the research department was basically uh, led by Henry Kaufman. Henry Kaufman, uh, chief economist, was a pioneer of uh, flow of funds accounts. Uh, he used to uh, pour over the Z1 accounts from the Federal Reserve and wrote every year prospects for financial markets based on uh, his insights from looking at flow of funds. And what I did was probably make a small step to say, well, look, hey, uh, the world is now global. Uh, you've got to look beyond the frontiers of the United States or North America, and you've got to start looking at the world. The world is a big place. Let's start tracking uh, money flows and liquidity worldwide. And that's basically what I've been doing, um, you know, in the years since I left Salomon Brothers. And that's what cross-border capital uh, hopefully excels at. Right. So yeah, I guess I always, I always think of that as like, you know, you know, what, what's the old quote? Um, absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's sort of liquidity flows corrupt absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's knowing where if you know where the money's money is, uh, you've got a very good idea about which asset classes are likely to go up or not. Right. So the understanding of how liquidity affects all manners of, of, of the economy and markets, I guess, was the main motivation. Right. I, I guess your days at Solomon informed the, the, the importance of liquidity. So how do you define liquidity? What are some of the main metrics that you're looking at? And, and, and I guess it's, it's useful to, to separate between financial markets, liquidity and economic liquidity. Right. Exactly. I mean, that that's precisely the point. Um, the first thing to say is that liquidity in a generic sense really has two, uh, two definitions. I mean, one is market liquidity, which is market depth. You can measure that through the size of bid ask spreads, uh, the size of transactions that you can undertake in markets. And that's a fairly conventional definition that traders would think of. But there's a, a stage before that, which basically facilitates market liquidity, which is what we call funding liquidity. And funding liquidity is really a measure of the of the credit available in the system, whereby dealers can actually take positions or investors can actually borrow to uh, speculate or whatever it may be. But it's funding liquidity, which really has become the main driver of, or the main engine of the financial system. 
And one of the ways that we explain that is to say that uh, it's, it's very different from thinking about interest rates in really this sense, that what we've got is a financial system that is really a, what I describe as a refinancing system. Now, it's not a new financing system. If you pick up an economic textbook or a finance textbook, what it says is interest rates are really the important fact to look at. Now, what is the rationale for that? The rationale for that is quite straightforward, is that basically capital markets are viewed as new financing vehicles. And so your interest rate is your cost of capital. There is an assumption behind that that credit is freely available. And you have a project and you compare the return on capital in the project with the cost of capital. And if there's a positive spread, you go for it. Straightforward. The trouble is that financial markets are no longer new capital raising vehicles. They're basically debt refinancing vehicles. And what we've got in the world is a debt pile of about $350 trillion. Now, the problem with debt is that debt doesn't go away very easily, and it needs to be refinanced. And the point is that with a $350 trillion loan on the world economy, on the shoulders of the world economy, that debt has an average maturity of about five years, which simple math says that you've got to roll $70 trillion every year. That's an eye-watering amount of debt. And essentially, you need balance sheet capacity to do that. And balance sheet capacity is liquidity. So in a refinancing world, liquidity is the paramount factor. Now, if you want to quantify that, if you look at capital markets globally, capital markets raise in new financing about $10 trillion. But they refinance, as I suggested, about $70 trillion of debt. So there's a seven to one loading of refinancing versus new financing. And that is how the world has changed. So liquidity is all important. Now, let's just focus on what happens if you don't get the roll on the debt. If you're a homeowner and you've got a mortgage that you want to refinance and you can't find anyone to roll that mortgage at the end of its term, sadly, you're homeless. And if you're a corporate that can't refinance your debt, you default. OK, so these are these focus the mind pretty clearly. And so what you can say is that liquidity is in many ways more important in a debt-ridden economy than interest rates. And therefore, what we can see looking back over the last 20 years is that every financial crisis has its roots in a refinancing problem. And that's, in essence, what we're saying. And you can look at the near term and look at SVB or any of these other regional banks that have had problems. This is all about financing. It's about the funding structure. And what we live in is not just a fragile financial world, but we live fundamentally in a fragile funding world. And that's really the key point. It's all about funding. And central banks need to wake up to that fact. And what they cannot do is use interest rates and in their balance sheet to tighten policy to essentially fight inflation, while at the same time trying to preserve monetary stability, because the two are direct opposites. So if the yeah, central banks can't it, use classical um, tactics like manipulating interest rates and manipulating the their own balance sheets, what tactics are available to them in order to help to manage the, the equilibrium between growth and inflation? Well, I, I'm not saying they can't use those. But what I'm saying, Adam, is that they've got to be very careful in terms of how they tread. There's an old saying in Ireland, which is, if you want to travel to Dublin, don't start from here. And the problem is we're starting from a situation where the debt load is 350 trillion. We shouldn't have got here. OK, why did we get to that situation? Because basically, uh, go back 15 years. And what did you see is central banks decided they were going to slash interest rates to near zero. And that incentivized the take up of debt. Now, why did that occur? It occurred very simply because they misread the inflation data. Well, you know, maybe they're doing exactly the same thing again right now. But if you go back to that period, uh, immediately after China entered the world economy through the World Trade Organization back in 2001, that basically uh, imparted a significant deflationary shock to the world economy. And what that led to was a cost deflation because Chinese labor costs were radically low relative to the West. And so the West could import cheap goods. And that came through in the price level. And essentially, it meant that we saw very low rates of price inflation. Now, the central banks misread that wholesale. And what they said was, this is actually 
uh, a worrying dimension because it's a monetary deflation. And we know what happened in the 1930s with a monetary deflation. You got depression, the whole system derailed. So what we've got to do is to avoid monetary deflation by slashing interest rates. And that's what they did. The problem is that it wasn't a monetary deflation. It was a cost deflation. Cost deflations are not really a problem at all. Actually, that's what capitalism does over the long term. It creates cost deflation. The problem is that governments and central banks alongside create monetary inflations. And that's effectively the balance or the, the, the imbalance in the system. Now, what they then said was that we're going to start to uh, cut interest rates and we're going to start pumping more money into the system to try and get the level of inflation up and avoid this monetary deflation. The problem is that that incentivizes this huge debt take up. And that's why we got into this mess. Um, and we've got to get our, ourselves out of it. And there's no easy way. But I would suggest one of the solutions, if solution is the right way of thinking of it, is to basically persist with this inflation policy and try and devalue the level of debt. Now, it's not easy. And as I said, if you go back to the, uh, to the, the jokey saying from Ireland, you know, if you want to go to Dublin, don't start from here. You shouldn't be starting from here. But we've got no choice. Is what it, a press is pause a here. Just, of, just one question. Is it a function of the last 20 years? Targeting 2% inflation was wildly aggressive then, given, given that as, as a policy statement and given the disinflation that was coming globally from experiences like China? In a word, yes. I mean, the, th the fact is that what the, what the central banks have got to pay a lot more attention to is the sources of inflation or deflation and to separate out what we call cost inflation stroke deflation from monetary inflation deflation. That's the key thing. Monetary inflations and deflations are very bad things. Cost deflations are probably quite good things. Cost inflations, well, we can debate, but probably on balance, not so good. I wanted to press pause because you you mentioned outdated textbooks. You've drawn an analogy with the 1930s. So I guess what I wanted to do is maybe go back a little bit in time and, and, and define or, or, or rather explain how this has evolved over time. So we had a certain type of monetary system up until the end of World War II. Then we had Bretton Woods. And now we live in a uh, post-Bretton Woods era but rather there's even a, a post uh, great financial crisis era. So I wonder if you might kind of explain how uh, liquidity has evolved since the beginning of the 20th century when uh, uh, currencies were backed by gold. And then we entered uh, the Bretton Woods and then fiat currencies as we stand today. OK, well, that's, it's, a, it's a very good point, um, Richard. If you, if you go back to what I was saying about monetary inflation versus cost inflation or whatever, what you would basically uh, discern from that is that if you've got a gold standard, it's extremely difficult to create a monetary inflation. Um, and ideally, maybe that's the sort of world we should be thinking of. You know, you need an elastic currency in times of crisis. And that's basically what, you know, the uh, ill working of the gold standard basically taught us uh, over the you know, two centuries of its, uh, uh, of its use. But you don't want an elastic currency the whole time uh, because basically you can't trust governments. And we know that. And if you have an elastic currency, basically what they want to do is to spend, spend, spend. And they finance it basically through monetary means. Now, you know, let's hold that thought because that's the world that we're entering big time. One of the things that we've been saying to our clients is, look, what you're seeing right now is that basically central banks are bailing out the banking system, right? But in the next few years, they can be bailing out governments because the fiscal arithmetic just doesn't work at all. And that's the problem. And what you've got in the US, for example, you've got mandatory spending, which is absolutely skyrocketing because of demographics. And that's even without adding on higher defense spending. So at the moment, if you look at CBO, Congressional Budget Office projections, they've got this huge increase in mandatory spending. But they're only assuming um, levels of defense spending of about 3% of GDP. If we go to a Cold War-like environment, that must step up easily to 5% of GDP. So that's going to start to widen the fiscal deficit enormously. And then you've got tax revenues, which are basically sluggish because basically the tax base is already squeezed hard from existing tax rates. Think about what AI could do in devastating that tax base. So what you've got is a big, big problem. 
And the only way that you can resolve that gap is for central banks to start printing money and do more QE. In other words, for the central banks to buy the treasury debt that's being issued. Now, you know, in the past, take the US as a great example, with a reserve currency, the US has had the luxury of being able to sell one third of its debt to foreigners. Who have been the big buyers of that? Traditionally, it's been Japan. Uh, it's been a bit Europe. UK has been in there. And China. Is China going to be taking up as much debt as it did over the last 15 years? I would suggest not. Um, doesn't mean to say that the dollar is, uh, is finished as a reserve currency. I don't believe that. The dollar is still in its fundamentally strong position. But there is a funding problem. And funding problems are what disturb financial markets. So what we've got into in basically the last century or so is a move out of fixed exchange rates where you basically prevented um, essentially monetization, monetary inflation to a world where monetary inflation is now the go to policy uh, for governments. And that's the danger we're in. Can we just take a moment because we, we did spend a, a minute to define what we mean by liquidity and contrast it against what many traders and other market participants might might describe as liquidity. But I think it's worth taking a minute to differentiate between cost inflation and monetary inflation. So can you just define what you mean by monetary inflation or deflation in the modern context? And yeah, is it different than the way we might have understood that during the 1930s, for example? Yeah, I think in the 1930s, what you had was a situation where it was very clearly a monetary deflation that was going on because there was a deliberate shrinkage of central bank balance sheets, which creates the monetary deflation. Now, let's be clear on what we mean by these two terms. So one, it, so when we're talking about monetary inflation or deflation, it all comes back to the monetary standard. Are you devaluing the dollar? Or are you, infl are you, uh, are you uh, revaluing the dollar, essentially? So that's all about essentially the supply of money or liquidity in the economy. It's, you know, it's how you denominate prices. And it's that benchmark which we're changing. The second point is about cost inflation or cost deflation, which is much more about costs. So that's saying if oil prices jump, OK, that is going to impart an inflationary uh, impact impulse to the economy. Now, I take the point that could be a relative price move. But still, in terms of how we view price indexes, consumer price indexes, you know, the fact is that if oil prices go up, retail prices, consumer prices rise as well. Equally, wages could be a source. Productivity could be a source. Uh, essentially, anything which is uh, interferes with the cost structure is an issue. But monetary factors are very separate from that. Now, what policymakers have got to do is to decide whether the inflation or the deflation that we're seeing in terms of the price level, is one bucket or the other bucket. And that's that's broadly what we're saying. They misread the situation in, uh, let's say, the early 2000s, where they thought it was a monetary deflation when it was, in fact, a cost deflation, and they got their policy mix wrong. And we're living with the legacy of that right now because that encouraged a huge uptake of debt. Uh, we can argue, uh, but it's probably a, you know, a, a, say a pointless argument, you know, what the mix is right now, I would say it's elements of both. You've got some cost inflation and some monetary inflation ongoing. But effectively, those two things, concepts have to be separated. Okay, so this is, this is incredibly fascinating. So would you mind spending a minute describing why policymakers made the mistake back in, in and around the global financial crisis? Or was it, was it sooner than that? Was it back in sort of 1998 during Greenspan's um, tenure when they began to make that mistake between um, price deflation or you know price inflation deflation versus cr um, cost inflation deflation. When did they make that mistake and what why did they make that mistake? What was the nature of that error? Well, I think it's it's hard to be sort of to be exact or precise as to why why these errors occurred. But I would say that you know part of the problem is that central banks have only recently taken on taken on an inflation remit or an anti-inflation remit. Traditionally, central banks have been there for financial stability reasons. That was the origins of central banks. They had to create an elastic currency. That was the reason the Federal Reserve was originally set up at the turn of the 20th century, creating an elastic currency. And that came back to, you know, if you 
probably recall from the history books, I think it was the San Francisco earthquake and the shift of deposits out of New York banks to try and pay for that. And that caused a, a financial crisis, which basically required some lender of the last resort to create an elastic currency. Now, uh, there have been other examples in Britain or in Europe. Again, uh, the central bank provided finance. Often it was, a, it was about wartime, but nonetheless, it was, uh, it was there. Now, recently, central banks have had an anti-inflation remit. Now, the problem is that that has been defined in terms of retail prices. And what I'm saying is they need to dig deeper into this whole thing. And from a central bank's point of view, a central bank can't control cost inflation very easily. And if cost inflation is a relative price move, why on earth should the central banks be involved in that anyway? OK, that's not that's not part of their game. Monetary inflation or deflation, I accept 100 percent. But that really comes back to the nature of the financial system of moving away from uh, what was originally a gold standard. Central banks have the ability now to basically create credit in the system. And that is a dangerous, uh, you know, dangerous role to play, particularly if they start inflating uh, money and devaluing the currency. So I'm a bit confused because I, I have the sense that the that central bankers continue to focus on uh, cost based inflation. Right. They continue to certainly when they are articulating their what's motivating their policy stance um, and their policy leanings, they focus on, you know, service sector inflation, housing sector yeah. inflation. You know, these are sort of PCE, CPI elements Correct. of cost inflation. But I thought I understood that you said that they were very concerned about a monetary deflation in in the global financial crisis. And that's why they took on the policy stance. So is it true that they sometimes are focusing on monetary inflation, deflation, and other times focusing on cost inflation, deflation, and they get when they should focus on one or the other wrong? Yeah, well, I think the, I, I mean, my point is that what they should do is to very carefully distinguish between the two, and they don't do that. And they basically, everything is fudged together. Now, central banks, re their remit is retail prices, okay? That's what, they're, that's what they're, they're supposed to control. And retail prices are affected both by monetary factors and by cost factors. Now, if you ask the central bankers what causes inflation, there'll be an awful lot of foot shuffling and head scratching because they, won't, they can't tell you what causes inflation, which may be a bizarre point to make. But it's a fact. They don't know what creates inflation. Okay, If they knew what created inflation, they wouldn't have made the errors they've made in the last two years, for heaven's sake. Now, part of the problem in terms of their policy going forward is what you might think of as a Milton Friedman legacy. And everyone thinks of Milton Friedman as basically being the monetarist, and therefore they should be paying attention to monetary aggregates. But actually, that's wrong, because the legacy that Milton Friedman left uh, imprinted in the central banks was not the fact that monetary factors cause inflation. It was inflation is caused by expectations. And if you go back to the legacy of Friedman, what he's really known for is the inflation augmented Phillips curve. Now, the Phillips curve, which is a wonkish concept if you're not an economist, but basically it's the way that central banks think about uh, inflation pressures. And expectations basically then uh, impart themselves on top of that Phillips curve and distort it. Now, what the central bankers are doing the whole time, and you can hear this echoing in every speech that's made by different governors, is they're trying to influence inflation expectations, right? This is what they're, because they're convinced that it's inflation expectations that drive future inflation rate. So they're never going to say, oh, look, hey, guys, we're going to cut rates. They're always going to say, OK, we're, we're still thinking about another rate increase next FOMC or whatever it may be. You know, that's never going to go away. That's what they're trying to do, influence inflation expectations. But that's the wrong policy. What they need to do is to focus on controlling uh, monetary inflation. It's a very different thing. Why should they be getting involved in uh, relative prices in the economy? That, that would be my point. When did this shift occur? When did they stop? Uh, focusing on, I believe it was the 1908 bank run. I, it really was at the turn, uh, at the very beginning of the 20th century, right? That the, I believe the Bank of England was instituted uh, before that under the, the ideas of Walter Badgett and, and sort of that lender of last resort. And so that's what you're alluding to when it comes to uh, 
monetary stability. When did central banks, and, and to focus on the Fed here for a moment, when did they start focusing on CPI or, or, or other measures of inflation as one of their uh, uh, policy objectives? And, and why did that take place? Well, I would, I, I'm not going to nail it exactly because I can't remember, but I would say it was in the 1990s. And basically, the first central bank to do that was the Central Bank of New Zealand. And why did, um, why did they choose 2%, which everyone seems to have followed? Well, I guess two is a nice number. You know, why not three? Why not four? Why not one? But two was a nice round number. So they chose that. I don't think there's any economic logic for 2% at all. I think it might be the function of 2% every 35 years, you cut money in half. And it's sort of a non-noticeable type of scenario and works within the lifespan of a human sort of career slash memory. So you, you can kind of, I'm making it up, but it seems Enough like reason. a nice, it, it seems like a nice spot to be, right? We've got to, you know, you, you're going to have a whole career. It's going to be under this sort of duration and you, yeah. you know, you're not going to really notice this inflation unless you zoom out to sort of a 35 year time frame. Yeah. Anyway, I, who so, knows if that's the truth, but. So, um, if central banks had not been focused on CPI inflation and had not um, made the mistake of conflating CPI disinflation with the potential for monetary disinflation, which I think I understand motivated their ultra low interest rate policy over that you know multi decade time span from say 2000 till you know, the end of 2021, um, how would their policy have been different? And how do you think the economic model that, that the economy runs on today would be different? Well, it, I mean, the, the fact is it would, it would be very different, but it would be a world that would, all, would be unrecognizable uh, to us because it would basically necessitate uh, a much smaller government sector. And the reality is that, you know, you, you can uh, you can only uh, governments can only spend effectively what they can tax or that's what it should be. Now, there are limits to how much you can tax people. We've been through that argument over the last 20, 30 years. OK, uh, it may have been forgotten, but it will probably come back again because uh, taxation is likely to have to go up in a lot of countries. But the reality is, is if you want to take on the spending <clears throat> commitments that have been made, these mandatory spending uh, programs, defense spending or whatever, you simply haven't got the tax resources to do that. You're effectively entering what you may generically call a wartime economy, where you need the central banks to print money. And that's the world that we're in. So, you know, I go back to what I said earlier on, is that what we're seeing now is the central banks are bailing out the banking system. And what they're going to have to do in the next decade is to bail out governments. There is no way that you can afford the fiscal commitments that are being made under current tax rules. OK, you've simply got to print money. There's no other way out of that. Or you've got to cut back your spending commitments radically. But with defense, uh, you know, spending high on the horizon, be on the horizon, it's likely to be high. You're going to have even more demands coming through. And that that's the sad reality. So, you know, effectively, what you're going to have to do is to move to a world that some have called financial repression. And that's, you know, unfortunately, the world we're in. Now, that will be characterized by significant monetary inflation. Now, you know, I, I can demonstrate some of these things, if you like, with some slides. And I'm very happy to do that. So I don't know if we can if we can put some slides up and. Let's just run through a few of those and, uh, you know, hopefully I can uh, whiz through them. One of the things that I was talking about, I just want to, uh, you know, flag is global liquidity in terms of definitions. And what this slide is basically telling us is what I hopefully argued earlier on is there's a difference between funding liquidity and market liquidity. And what uh, we're measuring with global liquidity is what you might call the capacity of capital not the cost of capital. Now, um, a little bit in terms of, uh, of background, uh, this is the size of the global liquidity pool and how it has grown phenomenally uh, in the course of the last um, 30, 40 years. So what you're looking at here is a pool of money that 
is approaching 170 trillion dollars, which is about one and three quarter times world GDP. So these are these are big numbers. And what you'll see if you pour over that chart is that China is playing a bigger and bigger role. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to whiz through some of these charts and I'm going to come to one right at the end, which uh, I'll come back to some of the earlier ones. But just bear with me. Um, these two, this chart here, first of all, is what we think of as the global liquidity cycle. Now, this is data that we monitor. We cover about 90 central banks uh, worldwide. In fact, the BIS, I think, says there are about 160 uh, in total worldwide. But believe me, 90 gets you right into the tail of those. Um, and this is the flow of liquidity as an index, uh, which is uh, benchmarked to an average of 50 with a range of, from zero to 100 of the flow of liquidity through global financial markets. Now, I want to stress here that we're looking at financial flows of liquidity, not real economy flows of liquidity. The real economy is a different sphere with which liquidity circulates. But this is purely the financial sphere. And what you're looking at here is a cycle that seems to repeat about every 65 months. And that's the sine wave we've drawn on that. Now, controversially, what I put there is, or what I show, is the latest data is at a lower inflection point. We're at the trough of the cycle. Bad things happen at the trough. You get banking failures. Good things happen at the peak in the sense that you get asset market booms. Hopefully, we're moving from a low point to a high point. But make no mistake that what we're likely to see is further pressure in the near term because around the trough, uh, to reiterate, bad things happen. You get SVBs, credit suisse defaults. These sort of things occur. Now, the reason that I'm saying that we're in a world where liquidity is likely to go up is basically thinking about this chart, which was the prior slide. This chart is basically showing... Uh, in orange, the slated take up by the US Federal Reserve of Treasury debt, according to the Congressional Budget Office. OK, these are not our figures. They're, uh, they're official or semi-official figures from the CBO. The dog leg down running from 22 to 25 is the slated uh, QT, quantitative tightening program that the Fed is undertaking. Uh, good luck with that, because I don't think we're going to get there. I think the best guess is that that orange bar probably flatlines from here. But look at the other side of the dogleg where it starts to go up significantly. And that's showing the projected increase in the size of the Fed balance sheet because of swelling Treasury debt. The, tre the Fed has to buy lots of this debt to accommodate the fiscal deficit in the US. But the problem is that assumes a 3% GDP defense spend level. I think that's too low. I would venture it's likely to be near a 5%. If you put 5% in, you get the gray bar. And the percentages are the implied growth rate of the Federal Reserve balance sheet each year thereafter. And what you can see is throughout that period to over the next decade, <clears throat> looking at double digit growth rates. Now, I hope I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. And what that says is you're looking at a significant monetary inflation coming through. QE is not going away. QE is here to stay. And therefore, investment managers have got to start to think about living in a world of permanent QE, because I can't think there's any way out of this. If that is true, you've got to invest for monetary inflation. And monetary inflation uh, means that certain asset classes do well and certain asset classes do badly. And I would suggest that fixed income securities are not really going to be a place to be in the medium term because they're the ones that will likely suffer. Equities may do quite well. Conventional monetary hedges like gold and precious metals should do well. Residential real estate may be a decent investment. It's always done fairly well during monetary inflations. And it may well be, and this is not an investment recommendation, it's an observation, that cryptocurrency tends to do well in monetary inflations. So these are things to think about. And if I dive back in the presentation, what you will see um, is some evidence maybe of some of those factors. Now, uh, I want to maybe, sorry, to do what's around. I want to start with this slide because this is the near-term global liquidity index. And what it shows with the annotations 
is the fact that at the lower point, you get banking crises, and at the upper point of the cycle, you get asset booms, and the annotations are trying to prove that with various facts uh, thrown in. So you can see basically how the world has moved and what's happened in the various QE phases uh, in the past. QE, by the way, is not a new phenomenon. Uh, it's, just, it's a clever marketing exercise. It used to be called open market operations, but it's been relabeled for quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. The other thing to look at is how closely global liquidity moves with asset prices. And this chart is looking at the growth rate in orange of global liquidity. And the black line is the returns on a world wealth portfolio. And that world wealth portfolio consists of all bond markets worldwide, all uh, equity markets worldwide, all liquid assets, uh, residential real estate, and precious metals and crypto. And what you can see is the correlation is not only close, but is tightened enormously in the last decade. So we've got to understand global liquidity. This is what's moving markets. Now, that's how the profile of liquidity is shifting. And the red element of the bar is the effect that liquidity has on real estate. And the orange bar is on financial assets. So that's just saying what's happened and how we project things. But what I wanted to focus on was this slide, because this is a very interesting slide. And what this shows is the growth rate of global liquidity once again, shown in black. The dotted line is our projection through year end. And the orange line is what we call monetary hedges, monetary inflation hedges. Now, that consists of a very simple metric, which is the value of the gold stock worldwide, plus the value of all cryptocurrencies together. Now, cryptocurrencies were clearly not an issue or not an element early on in that chart, but they became bigger and bigger. And they rose to become, I think, about 10 to 15 percent of that whole universe of monetary hedges. But you can see the correlation is remarkably close. And every time that global liquidity flicks up, you see a big move in these monetary inflation hedges. What has happened since the low point in the global liquidity cycle last October? Crypto has jumped and precious metals have jumped. They're monetary hedges. So the evidence is basically with these uh, elements right now. And therefore, we think that you've got an environment where liquidity conditions uh, are likely to continue to expand. So the expansion of monetary liquidity doesn't necessarily lead to price inflation, right? We One of the things that I think surprised a lot of people back in uh, 2008, end of 2008, and then 09, and then into QE, the, the multiple bouts of QE that we've had since then, was that the money printing or the balance sheet expansion of the Fed did not result in, in price inflation. And, and what I've come to understand is that because that money was not what's called or uh, uh, how Milton Friedman defined as high powered money. Right. There, there, there's two ways to, in, to increase high powered money. One is through deficit spending uh, by the government. Right. Uh, spending beyond what it collects in taxes. And then the other way is through uh, banks lending out money, expanding credit. And that's how you, you create that uh, uh, the, the high power money side of things. Whereas through QE, what you're doing is you're, you're increasing financial liquidity, which is essentially inflates financial assets. So you're not necessarily predicting that we're going to have price inflation, but you are predicting that monetary, uh, that uh, financial liquidity is going to continue to expand to fund uh, government deficits. Is that correct? Yeah, but I, I would I would say, let, let, let me be a little bit more precise, Richard. I think that the, the first thing to say is that um, I think we're going to get a situation where uh, monetary inflation will be a dominant feature in the in the future, that high street prices are a cocktail of monetary inflation elements and cost inflation elements, okay? Or sometimes it could be cost deflationary elements. Um, Essentially, it's that hybrid or that cocktail. Asset markets are dominated by monetary inflation factors. Okay, There's not much else in, in financial markets. Cost factors don't really matter that much. Maybe I'll come quietly on house building for sure. But generally, uh, it's all about monetary inflation. It's how that money is allocated into across different asset classes. So if you look at the impact of inflation uh, you know, 
going forward. What was the reason that uh, we didn't get the inflation after the global financial crisis? I would say two reasons. One was there was significant cost deflation anyway as a result of the recessionary uh, processes, the fact that China was still imparting a deflationary wave to the world economy, and as importantly, that money or liquidity did not get into the real economy. It was basically uh, contained within the financial markets. And that's another important consideration. So I think if you go forward, what you've got to say is that it's highly likely we're going to get monetary inflation. We cannot uh, rule out the fact that monetary inflation will spill over from financial markets into the real economy. And therefore, they will impart uh, a positive effect, an inflationary effect in consumer prices as well. Now, it's difficult to know the net impact because you've then got to take into account cost factors, which may well affect high street prices. And it may well be that AI um, causes a massive cost deflation. So then you've got an interaction between these two elements. So it's very difficult to work out what the end result is. My best guess is we're going to see volatile uh, consumer price inflation. Uh, the average level may be a tad higher, but essentially we're going to go from probably at the end of this year, very low uh, rates of inflation uh, at the consumer price level to probably in 2024, maybe a pickup again, may even come down in 25. But you get the point. There's going to be more volatile. So that, that's all we tend to argue with. Thank you. Yeah, Michael, it seems to me that the dynamic that you are projecting over the next decade is actually quite different than the one that predominated over the past decade insofar as the motivation for uh, central bank balance sheet expansion and ultra low interest rate policy in the past decade, arguably the past, the prior two decades was to incentivize the private sector and the banking system to create private sector credit to motivate more private sector demand. It seems like what you're suggesting is that over the next decade, the balance sheet expansion is going to be to a much larger degree motivated by needing to finance government spending, right? So right. government, like fiscal balance sheet expansion of governments, when government balance sheets expand, as opposed to central bank balance sheets expanding, it seems to me that is that typically leads to higher end demand. And that is a mechanism for the money that in prior the past two decades did sort of live in this cloud of financial assets now to come down to roost in the real economy, driving the potential for a, a pretty substantial uptick in final demand. How do you think that might, I mean, could you foresee a situation where we do, because of this persistence of much higher deficit spending, more money in the real economy on a year over year basis sus and sustainably over, over many years, does create CPI inflation, does motivate a much higher interest rate policy for longer at the same time as central banks shift from a, a quantitative tightening um, bias back to a QE bias in order to finance those government deficits? And then how do you see the interplay of that affecting financial markets in the next decade contrasting against what we've seen over, you know, especially the 2010s. Yeah, I think all of those things tick those, tick those boxes. I agree with that, everything you said. But what we are, we're looking at a very different world. Think of COVID squared or COVID cubed. I mean, it, that was the, that's the template you've got to think about, okay? What happened uh, when central banks financed governments? Governments basically spent that money in the real economy. What did you see? An inflation pickup, okay? What we know... Uh, you know, from years of experience, unfortunately, is that government spending is unproductive. Okay, it, It's inflationary and it creates demand, but it doesn't create supply. And what we need is more supply. So, you know, in order to get uh, the world economy or more particularly the Western economies bailed out, what you need is a return to supply side economics and effectively get the levels of profitability in industry up. Okay. Uh, you may also uh, have to ha adopt policies that you may think of uh, 
as normally being associated with uh, Northeast Asian economies or Singapore or whatever, which is directed credit to specific mm -hmm. industries to have favoured industries and to have the banking system essentially focus on that. That, in a way, is kind of happening to a large extent now under the green agenda. That That is what's going on. But I think we've got to start thinking more widely uh, in generally in supporting industries where particular countries have national interests or they have clear expertise. Well, I think also, I mean, we would probably have to take offline the value of shifting further into a supply side um, orientation economically, because that would spiral into a, a pretty heated debate, I think. But, but I do completely agree that credit guidance is likely to be, or what did you call it, directed credit? Is yeah, likely to window, be window guidance in Asia. Yeah, where governments will be more active in directing where they will incentivize the creation of credit in the private sector in order to motivate development, pro uh, production, et cetera, in certain sections, uh, sectors where they perceive to be a strategic deficit, right? I do want to take, and this may be a little bit parenthetical, and we don't need to dwell here, but you know, I would you agree that the way that governments have expanded their balance sheets over the COVID crisis was obviously much more likely to lead to a major demand shock without a commensurate supply reaction because they expanded their balance sheet in order to fire hose money directly into, into consumers' bank accounts and onto corporate balance sheets. There are ways that they could direct um, fiscal expansion into investment. For example, you know, the uh, Congressional Budget Office and the Society of Civil Engineers anticipates a $24 trillion infrastructure budget or deficit rather in the U.S. alone where, the, where governments to direct um, fiscal deficits toward investment, for example, in infrastructure or the, you know, recreation of a DARPA type program or what have you that has the potential to substantially increase innovation and um, productivity that would benefit the private sector and, and um, you know, individuals as well, right? So there are definitely different ways that governments can expand their, expand the balance sheet depending on how they decide to do it. It will have different effects on different segments of the economy and benefit one segment over the other, depending on which direction they go. Right. I mean that that's quite feasible. I think if you you know if you look at the the sort of math behind uh, these impulses, if you go back to the GFC immediately after the global financial crisis, central bank balance sheets expanded. Okay, so base money mm -hmm. in uh, economist parlance went up, but monetary aggregates like M1 or M2, which are retail bank deposits, did not. Okay. So in other words, money didn't get into the real economy. It stayed in the financial sector. What you saw after the COVID crisis was basically you saw uh, central bank liquidity balance sheets going up, but you also saw M1 and M2 surging. Now, that should have been a red light to the policymakers for sure, uh, but it wasn't for whatever reason. Uh, and I, I don't know why that wasn't, but it showed that there was excess demand in the real economy. Will we get uh, window guidance that will uh, suggest more infrastructure spending well, I mean, I have very much hope we do. Uh, I think that's a dream because as long as I've been in financial markets since the 80s, that's always been spoken about. The infrastructure deficit in the US or the UK has always been a hot topic. People always said, oh, it's coming. You know, that's what the Treasury is going to start looking at. It never comes. You know, the roads get worse. There's no infrastructure. I mean, you've got to look back almost to the Victorian era uh, in Britain to actually, you know, recognize decent infrastructure. I mean, it's been that long. And this is the problem. The you know the whole budget is being soaked up on things like social security spending, uh, unemployment, defence, these mandatory spending items. There's very little room for this discretionary spending. Do yeah, was it Alexander Banks. Hamilton who said um, the republic will survive until Congress discovers they can bribe the people with the people's money? Yeah, I think that's you know ab absolutely. I mean, all, all these sort of old adages 
a sort of you know a, a, a fantastic I think because that they're absolutely right and this is you know built of built of experience um you know um you know, there's I don't know how they can engineer policy to provide any higher margins to the private sector though right I mean like the private sector the corporate sector certainly and that end up the the um real estate sector have obviously been the greatest recipients of or benefited to the greatest extent from these financialized financialization policies over the last 10 or 15 years, right? I guess the, the question is where we had a massive financialization without fiscal expansion in the last decade, what does an economy look like with financialization and or financialization for the purpose of fiscal expansion, right? It seems to me that this is a very different dynamic where you could where you could have a substantially higher ambient level of CPI and PCE inflation at the same time as you've got dramatic acceleration in in monetary inflation. And it it's to me, it's not as obvious what that looks like from an investment perspective as the prior paradigm, which was obvious where the, all of the monetary inflation continues to live in the financial asset sphere and benefit financial assets. So what if, describe or, or speculate for me, if you will, what financial assets look like with persistent CPI inflation, like core CPI inflation in the neighborhood of five, 6%, interest rates, um, you know, positive real rates taking, um, you know, Fed policy rate into the seven eight percent range, at the same time as you have the type of QE environment that you're anticipating, does that change the um, relative attractiveness of stocks versus bonds versus residential real estate, um, et cetera? Yeah, hugely. I think that's right. I mean, we're moving into a world where government is going to become more, you know, more important, if that's the right way of putting it, or certainly a more dominant feature. I mean, that's clearly uh, a dangerous regime. Uh, I was going to quote you a second ago, uh, a quote I always have sitting next to me, which is from Ronald Reagan, which basically says, oh, the government's view of the economy could be summed up in a few short phrases. If it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. And if it stops moving, subsidize it. And that's the world that we're basically moving into. We're moving to a world where government is becoming more dominant. They're going to basically, they're, they're creating the background of monetary inflation. <sighs> They're basically going to start window guidance, I think, to direct credit into certain areas that uh, they deem to be important. Things like central bank digital currencies are coming because that gives them an extra degree of freedom. Uh, you could actually say after SVB, implicitly, we're a short step away from that because if the Treasury is implicitly guaranteeing all U.S. bank deposits, then you know it's a very short step to say, OK, you're actually got a liability now in the government uh, or in the in the in the Federal Reserve and by definition to the treasury. So I think all these things are coming. What does it mean for investment? Okay. Number one, I think you've got an inflationary, high street inflationary environment, which is higher, but more importantly, more volatile than we've seen before. Okay. So there'll be bouts of inflation, bouts of temporary deflation, but generally the average level will be higher. There will be attempts to uh, enact yield curve control. That's my view. Why is the, what's the reason for that? Is it because basically under this regime, you cannot stomach a high interest rate environment. Uh, and we said interest rates have got to be obviously above zero. But the question is how high? In Japan, where everybody knows that interest rates are near zero, interest payments take up an eye-watering 25% of the budget already. In the US already, uh, interest payments are a running a trillion dollars a year, Okay, even at these interest rates. OK, uh, what's the budget deficit? I think is about a trillion and a half. So you've got, you know, these are big, big numbers to start thinking about. And if interest rates go any higher, it's going to get worse. So effectively, you're issuing debt to pay interest. These things compound. We're on a knife edge. So monetary inflation is happening. Now, what does it mean in terms of, of asset investment? My view would be equities don't look too bad in this environment, providing we don't get uh, very high inflation rates of high street inflation rate, then I think there's a problem. But assuming that we get 
moderately high uh, inflation. I'm talking about two or three percent above where we are now. So maybe let's say an average level of maybe four or five percent in the medium term. Equities can still perform. You will find that uh, big corporations, as the last results season pretty much showed, can make money in this environment because their nominal sales growth is good. OK, uh, it may be, you know, this is part and parcel of the higher inflation environment. Uh, the monetary inflation goes somewhere. It's going into profit. So equities can do pretty well. Uh, if you've got yield curve control and financial repression, you don't really want fixed income. Uh, that's a dangerous area, I think, to be in. It may be a safe to some, by definition, but for the average Joe, it's going to be uh, a problem area. Uh, gold and precious metals, I think, stand out as a decent investment. Uh, you go back to the last time that the uh, U.S. authorities started a massive monetary inflation, and that was in the 1930s. Uh, it became illegal to hold gold. Uh, now, we're not back to that world because they can't do that again, I don't think. But, you know, you, you get the point uh, that uh, uh, basically it's an asset that people can actually make money out of. Uh, gold could go up a lot in this environment. If there is If there are questions about the integrity of the U.S. dollar in a global sense, what are other central banks going to buy? They don't want to buy renminbi. Uh, they're probably not going to buy euros. They're going to start buying gold. Uh, so uh, there's a limited stock out there. But look what, what the Chinese are doing. Look at what the Russians are doing. They've been accumulating gold. Uh, they know it's a decent asset. So I think that that's, you know, that's one thing. Crypto, dangerous word, dangerous prognoses. But you know, effectively, it's an asset that steps outside of the normal monetary frame. And traditionally, uh, short history, it's actually proved a pretty decent monetary inflation hedge. So I would be building a portfolio about those things. You don't want to have 100 percent in crypto. But if you put 5 percent in, you know, you've got a, you've got, uh, you know, you're in the game, skin in the game. It's hard to believe that policymakers aren't seeing a lot of the dynamics that you are describing. I mean, perhaps n n maybe not with the right, uh, right amount of nuance or or. Uh, taking the same conclusions, but it's hard to believe that they're not seeing this picture. Do you believe that because of the debt overhang that we're currently in and it continues to grow at a pretty rapid pace, uh, demographic uh, t uh, headwinds that are uh, th that appear to be, especially in the West, uh, uh, growing, uh, uh, stagnant growth, do you, do you think that they recognize that uh, inflating the debt away uh, is their best out, right? It's because the default is too painful. So this is their way out. And, and despite rhetoric, they actually want higher levels of inflation so that they can achieve some amount of deleveraging uh, into the system. Do, do you think that it's feasible that they're actually uh, calculating towards a, an end of that sort? I, th I think it's feasible among the policymakers. I don't think it's feasible. I mean, I don't think there's any necessarily joined up thinking among the politicians. I mean, the politicians are never going to get to grip uh, with this fiscal problem. They're going to kick the can down the road as much as they can. I think the policymakers are struggling in the face of that, of that, of that practical reality. And therefore, they've got to find ways of actually funding things. Uh, if you come back to uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing, and I think the Federal Reserve is doing a pretty good job here, generally. And, you know, the, uh, the fact is that if you take uh, US bank reserves, uh, which are not a bad heads up to the amount of liquidity that the Fed is injecting into money markets. Those are broadly speaking flatlined um, since the UK guilt crisis last September. I think the UK guilt crisis was a wake up call to a lot of policymakers because it showed what could go wrong. Uh, the spike in British guilt yields, British sovereign debt yields was eye watering at the time. It caused some big problems among pension funds and insurance companies, but it showed what could go wrong. Had that same event occurred in the U.S. Treasury market, there would undoubtedly have been a global financial crisis akin to 2008. Uh, fortunately, it didn't. But I think the U.S. Treasury and the Fed woke up to that risk. And I think there's been a deliberate policy since then to basically ensure that there is sufficient liquidity in the financial system since then. I mean, there's a slide. If you want to look at the slides, I can show you a slide which basically demonstrates that um, if there are some slides that we can put up. But, yeah, Ani, uh, can you put the slides up for us? Yeah, thank you. So let me let me just <clears throat> whiz on to this is the slide which shows U.S. bank reserves uh, at the Fed. The orange line is the actual data. Uh, what I've done is arrowed the U.K. guilt crisis. And since that point, you can see that there's broadly speaking been a flatlining, that the trend has been broken. 
Um, the red dotted line is what US academics deem to be a level of ample reserves for banks to operate in the system. And because there is an, uh, uh, a tail in the distribution where the smaller banks actually don't have the same access to reserves as the big banks like JP, JP Morgan or Citibank or whatever, uh, what I've done is drawn a one standard deviation um, dotted orange line there to show this is where the threshold really bites. And what you're looking at is you're sort of walking along that knife edge right now. So that's basically illustrating what the U.S. authorities are doing. I think they've they've understood the problem, but I'm, my view would be they've got to get liquidity up from here. Now, what has that meant for the market? Here is a nice little chart which basically shows NASDAQ, uh, which is shown there as the orange line, uh, and the red line is Federal Reserve liquidity injections on a weekly basis into the market. Now, tell me that liquidity doesn't matter, because it does. NASDAQ is a great long duration asset. Um, it basically, in other words, it responds to liquidity. And you can see the response here. If the Federal Reserve has got to keep pumping in liquidity, these are kind of the investments you want to be thinking about. So given the misalignment of incentives across policymakers, particularly the uh, the elected sort that are mo more focused on the uh, electoral cycles than anything else and, and spending uh, uh, the people's money towards, towards getting them reelected. Walk forward for us. I mean, you have these projections about the unsustainability of, of where we're headed right now. Where do you think uh, we're headed in terms of a, a tipping point and, and, and where do you see this going? You mean in terms of a tipping point as regards a crisis or... Yeah, I mean, as regards to the sustainability of, of QE forever, if you will, you, you, you suspect that we're headed for another large bout of QE. Where, where are we headed from here? Do, do, do you have a, a time frame uh, in mind? And, and what do you believe will, would be a tipping point? Well, I think the, the tipping point would basically come if you saw, uh, number one, significant high street inflation coming through. I mean, you know... I'm not going to say that won't happen. I'm not going to say it will happen, but clearly that's a, a time when you've got to start, you know, rethinking what the outcome could be. And in Put that a number for us, give us a range of inflation that that uh, fits the uh, description that you're. Well, it, it, historically, if you look at uh, if you look at how the U.S. market has been priced, the U.S. market has tended to have a sweet spot at about two percent inflation. Now that's the two percent. I'm not saying that central banks took that 2% target for this reason. But if you look at the data uh, taken from the from Robert uh, Schiller's website on inflation and market multiples, what you can work out is that 2% is a fairly good sweet spot to say that's when valuations uh, in the market were highest on average. Either side of that, deflation is bad for stocks. A lot of inflation is bad for stocks. Okay, It starts to get very bad for stocks once you get significantly above 5% inflation rates. So if you're talking about 5 to 10, that's not good. Above 10, we haven't really had periods very long of seriously above 10. Go back to the 70s for that. It was really a question of finding whatever high street inflation hedges you could get. And that was commodity prices, uh, precious metals, uh, real estate. Those things tended to do well in high inflationary environments. Uh, but, you know, we're not there yet. We're still sort of moving in the foothills of that. But that's clearly a danger. Another case could be you've got a serious devaluation in your currency. Um, and that is clearly a risk. What would happen in that case, I would su suggest, is that policymakers would have to start thinking about capital controls. Um, and the interesting point is that if you're among policymakers and you start to mention capital controls, there's no resistance. They seem to accept it may be a possibility. If you're in a, a smaller economy, an emerging market economy, that's probably a realistic thought anyway to try and preserve your, your, your sovereignty. And at the end of the day, what you've got to say, and the, the clear case of the British guilt market is a wake-up call here, is that the paramount uh, concern of policymakers is the integrity of their sovereign debt markets. That's what they really care about. If that goes awry, they jump in with alacrity. The UK overnight switched from uh, a regime of Q, uh, QT to QE. They bailed the market out very quickly. So why hasn't the why hasn't the Bank of Japan then 
jumped on this with the alacrity that you're describing, given that uh, we now see uh, JGBs going for days without trading. Uh, I mean, what are we missing here in terms of a, a lot of people like to look at Japan as sort of the end game from a demographic standpoint, from a from a, a growth stagnation standpoint. Uh, and, and now we see you're describing a, a future or a near future where we could have yield growth control in, in maybe Europe and in America. We already see it in, in Japan. Why why have we not seen uh, uh, more of a reaction from the VOJ or from the, the government in Japan, uh, given the lack of a, any meaningful liquidity uh, in the JGB market? Well, I think the I think the fact is that we that. You could you could say that actually that's what they they've achieved what they want to achieve. So basically, what you've got is the the uh, uh, the, the government or via the Bank of Japan controls the JGB market. Okay, it's it's pretty stable out there. They are, they're operating a yield curve control. Uh, people are suggesting that yield curve control may uh, may may be dropped. Actually, what I would say is going to change its nature. It's never going to be dropped. They're going to try and control this. If you've got a budget, as I alluded to before, where 25% is interest payment, believe me, they have to control interest rates uh, because otherwise the thing blows up. So you're going to have yield curve control in Japan. And you're absolutely right, Richard, to say, look, Japan is the template here. Japan is 20 years ahead of everybody else. We're looking at a, a Japanification in many ways. What you've seen in Japan is demographic pressures. You've seen uh, you know, negative inflation, in other words, deflation. Uh, you've seen QE policies, you've seen QT policies, you've seen yield curve control. Everything the Japanese have experienced has been reinvented 10 or 20 years later in the West. So you know, we're going to get yield curve control if we haven't already got it. They've got it in the Eurozone, for heaven's sake. It's, called, it's, it's this you know, spread control against different uh, uh, national bond markets. But it's, it's happening. It's going to happen in the US in some form. What's interesting is that the JGBs were never, never played the role of tier one collateral in the financial system. I mean, JGBs were only ever held by um, Japanese citizens. And over the last 20 years, they've been effectively absorbed by the JGB, uh, by the BOJ, rather. Um, well, it, it, well, in actual fact, it, it, just to correct that, I mean, they, they, were, they were held by the banks. Um, basically, what's happened is that the BOJ has bought them from the banks, and that's why, because they bought them from banks, there hasn't really been any massive monetary uh, inflation in the real economy. So the monetary aggregates in Japan have not really blazed ahead because of this QE, because they've been buying the stuff from the banks, and that's a, a wonkish operation. But believe me, it's one of the reasons that you haven't had uh, the big inflation problem in Japan. Now, if they start to get the monetary aggregates moving, then you will get uh, inflation in Japan. I mean, starting already, I suppose. Yeah. This, so that thank you for that correction. That, that's fair. I guess where I was going with that is that um, treasuries are um, tier one collateral, but they're all also a primary savings vehicle for mm -hmm. um you know, foreign foreign governments, foreign central banks, foreign sovereign sovereign wealth funds, and domestic savers, domestic insurance companies and pension funds. Um, higher interest rates on JGBs don't really matter because they're just paying higher interest payments to the the um, the Bank of Japan, whereas higher interest payments. So you know, if you get to a point in the U.S. and in Europe where um, we're paying 25% of our budget is going to interest payments, that is a massive subsidy to the private sector as well. That's a massive, you know, transfer, wealth transfer, income transfer from the government every single year to the private sector is another mechanism where, in Japan, again that wealth transfer is irrelevant because all of that wealth moves from the fiscal balance sheet to the J to the bank Japan balance sheet. When you move that wealth to the private sector, that starts to become a major um, can potential consumption impulse as well. Like you get into a situation where CPI inflation begins to accelerate by virtue of the fact that the government is having to transfer so much of 
its budget year in, year out to the private sector just in the form of interest payments. So it becomes this self-perpetuating inflation spiral unless or until the point where the Fed and the ECB own so much of the treasury market and the European uh, sovereign bond market that it again just becomes a effective accounting transfer between one government entity and, and another government entity. But in the meantime, that is an interesting lever that needs to be considered as these the percent of, of government deficits that flow towards interest payments continues to accelerate in the context of this you know, continued expansion of government spending that you see on the horizon over the next decade or so. Yeah, but they're, but they're paying for that in the West through printing money. So effectively, it's a, it's a monetary transfer to the private sector, but it's a, it's a monetization. So you, what you're doing is you're creating more and more, it's more and more QE, more and more monetary inflation. And that's the problem. The other issue you've got is that uh, this uh, government debt, treasury debt, particularly US Treasury, is collateral in the system. So the trouble is that the more you play around with that, the more you, you mess up the financial structure. And one of the things that, you know, actually it's one of the reasons that I don't believe that there's going to be a deep recession in the US because the yield curve, which is a lot of economists' metric as to how bad things are going to get, this deeply inverted yield curve, actually one of the main reasons the yield curve is deeply inverted is the fact you've got highly negative term premia at the far end of the curve. Now, that's a very wonkish concept, but the reason you've got very negative term premia, uh, like record lows, <laughs> or in record negative lows, uh, is the fact that there's a shortage of collateral in the system. Right. So, so it's not that there's a lack of demand for, for the far end of the curve. It's just that there's such an unbelievably insatiable demand for tier one collateral in the at the very short end of the curve. And that's why it's tipping the curve into inversion. Yeah, yeah. Term premium are very negative. Right. And I think that brings you know, the the shadow banking system, which I think we haven't really touched on today, but the, the euro dollar market and this this sort of parallel system that exists uh, uh, for, for financing outside of the purview of the treasury and of the US regulatory uh, framework. <clears throat> In Europe, in Asia, how does that affect uh, uh, the, the the Fed's ability to control monetary policy, given the, okay. the size I mean, of this market? Yeah, I, maybe to sort of to correct it. I mean, it, the euro dollar market is a bit of a misnomer in a way. I mean, it's nothing like as important as it used to be. Uh, it's a sort of generic term uh, that people often use. It, there's a big difference between euro dollar flows, which is basically actual lending flows, uh, basically uh, offshore lending flows, which have actually, look at the BIS data, they've shrunk you know, quite significantly as a proportion of total capital flows or total flows uh, in the last 15 years. And the euro dollar futures market, which is basically the market or traditional market in terms of hedging the yield curve. Now that's moving more onshore into the sofa market now, but uh, in the US, but effectively, this is a futures market. So let, let's not confuse the two. In terms of offshore funding, which is probably, Richard, your point, there is a lot of ability of US banks, not necessarily Euro-based uh, banks, to do lending uh, through things like FX swaps. That's, that's a big market. That's probably a more important market, I would venture. And there's a lot of uh, engineering, but behind that, you need collateral. And the lending system that we're looking at now, which is, again, sort of wonkish for a lot of people, is fundamentally based on collateral. It's not based on trust. Trust disappeared in 2008. Everything now has to be collateral based. And if you look at what's driving liquidity in the world, it is effectively both central bank balance sheets and the pool of collateral that's available uh, to borrow against. Now, that pool of collateral is consisting fundamentally of treasury debt, sovereign treasury debt in the big economies, okay? Now, one of the things that this sort of says is that you've got to look at that pool and that pool has to be expanding if you want liquidity in the, in the medium term. So it can either come through expanding central bank balance sheets, which I'm saying we're going to get, or that pool of collateral has got to expand, but that naturally will happen because of more debt issuance probably. Uh, 
Um, so that's 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 something you're looking forward to. The other thing to say is that re reserve currency status is absolutely critical. And that's one of the things we've got to start thinking about. And that's why, you know, broadly, you know, I would come back to what is probably a, a contentious statement is that we're still in Bretton Woods one. We've never left Bretton Woods one. The dollar is still paramount. OK. And if you look at the backdrop of what Bretton Woods one really was, uh, almost every box is still ticked, apart from the fact we've got floating exchange rates and we've got free capital movements. But free capital movements are always an aspiration. And I would contend you couldn't have free capital movements and uh, fixed currencies anyway. So essentially, everything is still there. Dollar is central. Uh, US military backstops the World Trade Center. IMF and World Bank still police uh, payments and balances. The system still exists. All those people that suggest that China is suddenly going to muscle in and displace the dollar, dream on. That's never going to happen. Um, and you know, uh, pardon? Yeah, yeah, I, that's a, that's such a good point because, you know, and you made this point all along and it's this part of it's just clicking for me. But in an economy where the flow of trade capital is dwarfed by the Re, by the need for refunding capital, the desire for a few countries to get together and form a trade block in a different currency denomination is completely irrelevant. The only thing that matters is what assets represent tier one capital that collateralize the entire financial system and what currency is that tier one capital denominated in. The, rea the reality is the only tier one capital is still short-term U.S. treasury securities and denominated in U.S. dollars. So until we completely change the, the entire funding status of the global financial system, there is no contender for another you know, competitor global currency. Exactly. I mean, in other words, to, be, to run the global currency, you have to act as banker to the world. And what that means is that if the world needs credit, you give it credit. If the world needs savings products, you give it savings products. Why is the US dollar dominant? Because US financial markets are dominant in the world. They're deep, they're liquid. And that's the simple reason why the US has a big trade deficit, because its financial sector is so efficient. Yeah, I There's love definitely it. been a lot of chatter and a lot of noise around peak dollar and what Adam uh, was alluding to a moment ago re regarding uh, the BRIC countries, uh, uh, you know, stating very publicly that they'd rather trade in their own currency or, or, or create their own uh, s sort of medium of exchange and, and step away from the dollar. So th th that seems like a lot of narrative. It sells a lot of newspapers. But as you've so eloquently described today, the the uh, need for refinancing dwarfs everything else. But do you agree or, or, or how do you think about, uh, you know, given the sanctions and, and, and given what's happening geopolitically, the appetite at the margin for foreign central banks and, and, and foreign uh, uh, actors in general that might find themselves on the opposite side of any major issue against the U.S. Uh, and, and, and risk having their assets seized or frozen in, in, in any capacity? Do you think that that... Uh, 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 reduced propensity at the margin to uh, uh, allocate to treasuries, could that uh, uh, be a, a factor of, uh, of any meaningful magnitude? And, and, and would that perhaps uh, force the, the, the Fed to have to uh, buy more treasuries and expand their, their balance sheet faster? H how do you think about that? Well, I think that the, you know, what I alluded to sort of earlier on was there was a, a, a coming uh, fiscal problem in the US. But let's be clear here that the US is probably the cleanest shirt in the laundry, uh, in the global laundry. Uh, everyone else has got a far, far, in a far, far worse situation. So, you know, in terms of paper money, uh, the dollar will stand out as being, I think, a, a, a currency in demand. And I still think that the paper dollar, let's stress that word paper dollar, is still in a long term bull market. Because I think that people are waking up to the idea that why, you know, <laughs> You, you can try and diversify, but what are you going to diversify into uh, in paper money terms? I mean, you can try and diversify into Chinese renminbi. Well, good luck there. Okay, the Swiss franc is too small. Uh, sterling is probably toast. 
Uh, the euro is a very fragile currency. So what, so what are you left with? I mean, there's nothing else. The Japanese don't want people to hold yen. So you're really left with the US dollar. And uh, the other alternative could be gold. And I would say that gold is an interesting vehicle. But then, you know, what I would argue is that the dollar may not go up against gold, but the dollar will go up against all these other currencies. And in this world where collateral is important, uh, reserve currency status is absolutely paramount. Now, the problem that, you know, a lot of these countries, other countries have got, take, for example, Saudi Arabia, is if Saudi Arabia has got a large surplus, uh, trade surplus through oil, where is it going to deploy that surplus? What can it invest in? Uh, and that's really the question. The only thing you can really invest in is basically in financial asset terms is U.S. instruments. They, they will dominate the portfolio. Uh, China hasn't doesn't have the depth of financial market. Uh, you know, I wrote a book a few years ago called Capital Wars, which was very much on these themes. And basically it said the, you know, the great irony here is that uh, basically, the Chinese economy is on a dollar hook. Uh, they've got a whopping great industrial sector. But they've underdeveloped their finance sector. And they basically, at the end of the day, export dollars. <laughs> That's one of their major exports. And, you know, they've got to get off the dollar hook, but they can't do that very easily. It's a huge challenge for China. I think um, it makes sense to, I, I don't want to to end this conversation with that, at least discussing implications for the debt ceiling. I mean, obviously this is a, a great dramatic conflagration at the moment. Um, from a political standpoint, do you see any major potential for real dislocation here? Or do you expect that this is gonna be resolved amicably or without you know, some sort of major signaling mechanism from financial markets that's, that's gonna motivate politicians to uh, converge on a solution. Okay, well, I mean, I'm, I'm clearly looking at things from the outside uh, in. So uh, being in Europe, uh, you know, maybe I can take a sort of more, more dispassionate view. But I think that, you know, it strikes me it's very much in Biden's interest to let this thing run as long as he can, because it will cast the Republicans in a bad light if there is any disruption. I think that if there is, uh, if it does come to the wire, uh, the normal progress is that, or the normal normal procedure is that interest payments are made first, so there'll be a government shutdown uh, in whatever form. I don't think the Republicans would be as foolish to let that happen because it would be a gift to the Democrats, I guess, in this situation. But that's my view from the outside. I think from a U.S. national point of view, uh, it's anyway becoming a gift to the Chinese. You don't want to do this. This is not uh, clever politics, geopolitics. Uh, at the end of the day, what it's telling us is there are limits on government spending and we're getting near these thresholds. Uh, but the fact is that we've got a situation where mandatory spending in the US, in Europe, in Britain uh, is potentially skyrocketing because of demographic pressures. And we've got as, a soci as societies to come together and think about how this is resolved. The politicians aren't going to solve it. They're just going to kick the can down the road. Um, and we're going to you know, face more of the same. There'll be more debt ceiling issues in the future, as sure as eggs are eggs. But this one, I think, is unfortunate. Uh, but, you know, hey, I think we get through it. I think the interesting question, which a lot of people are voicing about how the markets react to this, is that you know, clearly if there is a default, rates, I think, will spike and there'll be a significant sell-off uh, if that's the case. I don't think we're going to get there, but, you know, never say never in financial markets. I think the other side of the debt ceiling issue is one about, you know, how quickly is the tre Treasury general account at the Federal Reserve refilled? It's right down to about 80 billion right now, which is rock bottom levels. Uh, the Treasury Secretary Yellen is talking about uh, raising it to 600. That would be a withdrawal of liquidity from the markets. And if that happens, it's, uh, you know, uh, markets are going to go down if that's the case. I don't think the Federal Reserve is that foolish. Uh, they read the same newspapers as we do. And now, therefore, I, I would suggest that the reason that uh, one trillion in treasury bills are being mooted as uh, an issuance uh, pattern in the future is that they're very concerned about liquidity. And therefore, if they do this, they will try and withdraw money from the reverse repo, which is essentially a sterile pool of liquidity, which is not in the markets. And that will be the way to resolve it. But, you know, if you to put it another way, if you're raising a uh, trillion dollars in treasury bill issuance, in other words, getting the reverse repo down, and you're only increasing the Treasury general account by 
circa 500 billion, there will be a net liquidity impulse into the markets, and that should be positive. And I think that's what the markets need, the banking markets need, because they basically are running on low levels of liquidity right now. We can see that. So, Michael, for the, for the benefit, um, I didn't quite close a loop on what the actual mechanics are. So um, we're right down to the wire. We've got, you know, the Treasury General account is almost empty. As you say, it's sort of, I think you said it was around 80 billion. And we're, we're going to get closer to zero over the next couple of weeks unless the things get resolved relatively quickly. Correct. Um, Yellen has said she wants to get to, I think you said somewhere in the neighborhood of six or eight hundred uh, billion dollars into the TGA. Um, there are a few different mechanisms for that to happen. One is for the Treasury to issue debt into the market, right, which would be net liquidity draining Correct. from the market. But the other one was to drain the, um, the, the reverse repo facility. Can you just walk through what the actual mechanics of that are relative to issuing new debt? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the what you've got is about two point six trillion, uh, which is on the Fed balance sheet in something called the re the reverse repo pool. Uh, that is money which is outside of the money markets, outside of the banking system. Uh, if that reverse repo pool came back, bank reserves would go up by a commensurate amount. So, in other words, you'd see a one off shot of two point six trillion. Uh, back into bank reserves if the reverse repo disappeared. Okay, so it's that important. Right. Now they can't; they they won't get the whole thing out. But what they're talking about is, or mooting, is maybe issuing uh, treasury bills of maybe a trillion dollars, and that will be money that the money funds, money market funds, they like government paper, and treasury bills are a direct one to one substitute for a reverse repo. A reverse repo is another way of thinking of it is uh, a bill issued by the Federal Reserve. That's all it is. Right, I see. I understand. So the, so the idea here is they will still issue um, debt, but they'll issue debt in the form of bills rather than coupons, and therefore it won't draw funds out of the um, global liquidity pool, but rather it's effectively just a substitution for the what's already in the RRP. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, I got you. And then, and then, so... In aggregate, that would be liquidity neutral, but because the market is um, is fearful that they that they might issue some coupons as part of the mix in order to refill the TGA, you feel that the market would feel some relief on that announcement because it's less bad than some had maybe been fearing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in actual fact, it may be it may add liquidity to the system if they manage to get the reverse repo down significantly. And how would they, but, but issuing bills instead of coupons doesn't actually pull money out of the RRP. Would they then change policy to, to incentivize the, the funds in the RRP to move back directly into bank reserves? Well, you're, you're right to say that it's not automatic. I mean, we're, we're just guessing here to say that it's logical that if you had a, a lot of bill issuance, that the money funds could substitute. Uh, I mean, you'd have to obviously give a slight interest rate in, uh, incentive they could uh, move into the bills rather than uh, the reverse repo. So the reverse repo would naturally come down. The TGA would fill up uh, to an extent, but government sp ongoing government spending would then basically release liquidity into the money markets. I understand. I got it. So you're just shifting money. The, the money that's in the RRP will be used to purchase the new bills. Correct. And the new bills would need to be at the margin slightly more attractive in order to entice them out. Yeah, understood. Correct. Thank you. Michael, you've been really generous with your time. I feel like we there's so many threads that you've uh, laid here that we could continue to pull and, and, and continue on for, for another hour easily. But I guess that's just a good reason to have you on again uh, soon to, to continue the conversation. Uh, guys, I think this might be a good place for us to uh, put a pin on the conversation. And Michael, where can people find you? How can we uh, continue to, to follow your work? Well, it's very kind. Um Crossbordercapital.com um, is the website. Um, on Twitter, we have a handle which is at crossbordercap. And if you want, if anyone's interested in this wonkish stuff and has uh, sleepless nights, there's a book I wrote a few uh, years ago called Capital Wars, uh, which is published by Macmillan Palgrave, which is 
uh, generally quite readable. It's a bit, it's a bit academic, a bit wonkish in places, but generally it speaks about all these liquidity issues. Is there another book forthcoming? Conversation. I'm sorry. This is there another book forthcoming? Well, I mean, I, the publishers want me to update this for COVID, but uh, I, it's a big job. But I, I'm thinking about it. Thank you. Well, Michael, yeah, this has been incredibly fascinating and illuminating. Really appreciate your uh, sharing expertise and and uh, taking the time with us today. Hopefully, we'll have you back sometime soon to update views and um, continue the learning process. Great, guys. Thank You're you. Here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. So long. This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for resolve-masterclass.